updates. DPS stops a human smuggling attempt in Laredo. 49 migrants found inside a trailer. And a potential government shutdown could impact crucial federal programs. We'll be looking for temperatures that are not in the triple digits. Uh, we are also hoping that the dome actually goes away and gives us a chance at a few showers. We'll talk about that coming up. And a New England Patriot fan died during the game on Sunday night. We have the latest in sports. You're watching 25 News Now at 10. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Don Brubaker. And I'm Karina Garcia. The Goliad County Sheriff's Office made a traffic stop in the 9,000 block of U.S. Highway 59 South. They arrested Ivan Farias of Mathis for unlawful possession of a firearm by a felon after he was found to have a pistol. Farias also had a warrant out of San Patricio County for theft of a firearm. The recent uptick in migrant border crossings is creating more challenges for border agents. Today, about 3,000 migrants crossed at the U.S.-Mexico border near Eagle Pass, where many waited under a bridge until they were transported to a processing center. Border officials are struggling to keep up with the recent surge that started over the weekend. Eagle Pass Mayor Rolando Salinas Jr. signed an emergency declaration Tuesday, citing a, quote, severe undocumented immigrant surge, unquote. This declaration will provide a additional resources. As a response to the recent migrant surge, the Biden administration's response tonight was to grant protection to hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans who arrived in the country as of July 31st. Those migrants get temporary protected status, making it much easier and faster for them to be able to work in the U.S. And Tuesday, DPS South Texas Region Special Agents stopped a human smuggling attempt in Laredo, where 49 migrants were found inside a commercial trailer. Special agents were quick to remove the migrants who were locked in inside a poorly ventilated trailer. The migrants included 44 males and five females from Guatemala, Mexico and Honduras. There's been a change in leadership for the Luther Hotel, an historic hotel in Palacios that will avoid demolition. We have 25 News Now Weekend anchor Adam Seibel in studio with more. That's right, Don and Karina. So Miss Ann Finley-Jones, she's the sister of the owner of the Luther Hotel. She's resigned from her post as independent administrator of the Luther Hotel. So in this change of leadership, the judge appointed a new dependent administrator. Dependent meaning that these decisions related to the hotel will now be made as a team, with the Palacios Preservation Association being pleased with this decision. The new temporary dependent administrator is a lawyer with a great deal of experience in this area and will be involved directly to save the hotel. And that's according to Margaret Dowdy. She's on the Palacios Preservation Association. Um, there was an agreement to move from independent administration to dependent administration. Um, and that means that the uh, administrator would have the support of the judge and the advice from the judge. And so it wouldn't just be one person making decisions. It would be decisions that were being made jointly. Um, so that's a very, very good uh, decision. The newly appointed dependent administrator will be meeting with the Luther Hotel leadership team Friday. There are plans in motion to get fans inside the hotel and to get the electricity back on, as well as a plan to get the interior of the hotel cleaned up. Margaret added that for the first time, it feels like everyone involved in this legal process is on the same page. Great feeling for anyone who wants to save the Luther. Don Karina, back to you. Adam, thank you. Zach Lynn's Parkway Loop 463 will close between Houston Highway and Lone Tree Road from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. This is part of the Loop 463 bridge widening construction project. And that'll continue tomorrow night. For, and that's the last night for that. And let's take a first look at your forecast with First Orange Storm Team Chief Meteorologist Mac Pettis. Mac, I just got a first look over here at your thermometer. It's right. It's under 80. I can't remember Ooh. the last time that happened. We, you know, I mean, really, we're excited, folks. It's 79. <laughs> you know, we haven't seen those temperatures at night in quite some time. Uh, but uh, uh, today, you know, with the dry air, we still got fairly warm, get up to 96 degrees. But you'd think we could get back at least down to average. Haven't done that in a while. We'll be talking about your weekend and the chance of uh, a few little light showers. And then we'll also take a look at the Atlantic. All that coming up in a moment.
Mike, thank you. A new ERCOT report says the Texas grid is ready for fall power demand. KCEN reports ERCOT officials say there could be rotating power outages if an extreme scenario happens. The report says Texas is expected to have enough power generating capacity during peak demands this fall under normal system conditions. This comes after a summer where Texas broke several power demand records. Today, Attorney General Merrick Garland testified before the House Judiciary Committee. He was rebuking the notion that the Justice Department is biased. In his first appearance on Capitol Hill in months, Attorney General Merrick Garland facing hours of questions from the House Judiciary Committee. Never in my life would I would thought that I would see such a politicized DOJ. Republicans focusing most of their questioning on President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, who was indicted last week by special counsel David Weiss, who Garland appointed. Can you tell us about any briefings or discussions that you personally have had with Mr. Weiss regarding any and all federal investigations of Hunter Biden? I'm going to say again. I promised the Senate that I would not interfere with Mr. Weiss. So Democrats accusing their GOP colleagues of carrying water for the former president as his legal woes continue to mount. So I welcome you to the law firm of Insurrection LLP, where they work every single day on behalf of one client, Donald Trump. And they do that at the expense of millions of Americans who need the government to stay open. As former President Trump continuously rails against federal agencies like the FBI and DOJ, Garland maintains that his department acts free of influence. Singling out individual career public servants who are just doing their jobs is dangerous, particularly at a time of increased threats to the safety of public servants and their families. We will not be intimidated. Congress holds the power of the purse, and New York Congressman Jerry Nadler asked the Attorney General what the consequences would be if the FBI were to be defunded, a suggestion from some far-right Republicans. They would be catastrophic. Liz Landers, Thank ABC you. News, Washington. The White House warning today that a looming government shutdown could threaten crucial federal programs with the government funding set to expire September 30th. House Republicans who hold a majority in the chamber are trying to push a plan that would temporarily fund the government and beef up border security. But the Republican caucus appears deeply divided. And even if House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is able to unite his party under their spending plan, the victory would be short lived. The hard right bill with steep 8% cuts to many services would be rejected by the Senate where Democrats are in control. If Republicans hold Republicans back from moving bills, it's like you're walking into a fight losing. And I, I've never understood that situation. So I want to be able to win these battles. If lawmakers are unable to reach an agreement, active duty military and federal law enforcement personnel would be forced to work without pay and FEMA's disaster relief fund, which is running dangerously low, could be depleted. Here's your viewer poll tonight. Scan that QR code on your screen to vote now. The question is, are you concerned about a potential government shutdown? Yes or no? According to these results tonight, 55% stand at yes and 45% stand at no. Thank you for voting tonight. Visit us tomorrow for our latest viewer poll. Yesterday, the United States Department of Education recognized 26 Texas public schools as National Blue Ribbon Schools for this year. Up to 420 schools are nominated each year. The only Crossroads school to get the honor this year, Industrial ISD Elementary East. The schools are judged on all student scores and graduation rates. Elementary East was considered a high-performing Title I campus based on reported star scores. The biggest reward is, is that it honors your staff, your kids, your families, your community for all the hard work that they put in to each and every one of these little kids each and every day. A group of three from Elementary East will travel to Washington, D.C. in November to receive the National Blue Ribbon School Award. Five beaches in the crossroads will be part of this Saturday's Adopt a Beach Cleanup. Magnolia Beach at Indianola and Kingfisher Beach at Port O'Connor in Calhoun County will get the cleanup as well as Palashes in Matagorda County. The Adopt a Beach Cleanup runs from 830 in the morning until noon this Saturday. 
Today was open house day inside one of Victoria's well-known care centers. Mary Garcia, director of Affectionate Arms Adult Day Health Care Center, said today was a day for the community to stop by and see what their facility provided and has to offer. She said this week was especially important for Affectionate Arms to spread the word about what they do and what they need. We are uh, celebrating all these events because of National Adult Day Health Care Week. And so we take this uh, opportunity to bring awareness to the community about uh, what we are and the services that we provide. And Garcia says they will end adult day services with an auction this Saturday on September 23rd from 1 p.m. until 3 p.m. It will take place inside the Affectionate Arms location at 3802 John Stockbauer in Victoria. Here are some of the top headlines you can read in the Port Lavaca Wave. The Port Lavaca City Council approved a new ordinance to remove curfews for juveniles in their monthly meetings. Plus, the Memorial Medical Center celebrated its 10th anniversary last Tuesday. You can read these stories and more at theportlavacawave.com. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click the notification bell. You can see Crossroads Today on YouTube. How about that? And stay with us. Coming up on 25 News Now at 10. Authorities in Illinois give an update in the deaths of multiple people and animals found dead inside a home. Also ahead, the man accused of killing a Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputy in an ambush shooting was in court today. in Romeoville, Illinois, believe they have identified a suspect in the deaths of four people and three animals killed over the weekend there. Authorities said there was a link between the family of four and a man, in, and a man involved in an accident in Oklahoma. A 31-year-old man, Nathaniel Huey Jr., and an unnamed woman were identified as persons of interest in the killings just hours after the bodies of two adults, two children, and three dogs were discovered inside the home. This morning, Acting on a digital license plate reader alert, the Catoosa, Oklahoma Police Department was alerted to the presence of the suspect vehicle in their jurisdiction. Authorities say they are waiting for Oklahoma authorities to complete their investigation into the incident. They did not reveal a motive in the killings as of yet. The bodies of the families were discovered when the man did not show up for work. 
The man accused of killing an L.A. County Sheriff's deputy in an ambush shooting pleaded not guilty to murder. The 29-year-old arraigned and entered a double plea of not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. He was arrested after he was accused of shooting and killing 30-year-old deputy Ryan Klinkenbrumer while the deputy sat in his patrol car. In addition to murder, other charges against Salazar include murder committed by lying in wait and murder committed by firing from a car. A study shows that quitting smoking is linked to lower risk of household food insecurity. A study by the University of Minnesota School of Public Health found that those who quit smoking were less likely to experience food insecurity in their household. Using surveys from the Census Bureau and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, researchers found that continuous smokers had 1.85 times the risk of household food insecurity compared with those who had recently quit smoking. And the probability of food insecurity was 20% for continuing smokers and 11% for those who stopped smoking. Food insecurity and tobacco use are major health issues in the U.S. and both have a disproportionate effect on people of color and low-income households. While 10% of all households are considered food insecure, roughly 32% of households below the poverty line experienced food insecurity in 2021, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Similarly, people who face social disadvantages are more likely to smoke due to factors such as aggressive marketing towards these groups and uneven access to resources for those trying to quit. For tips and resources to stop smoking, speak to your doctor. And if that isn't possible, visit the CDC website for free resources aimed to help people quit. With this Medical Minute, I'm Justin Finch, ABC News. Here are some of the top headlines you can read in the Quero Record. The DeWitt County Historical Commission will hold a Lives Remembered presentation September 23rd. And Timothy Pointer seeks Republican nomination for district attorney. Plus, Quero resident Pat Trevino publishes a new book based on a true story called Burning Faith, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church Fire Christmas 1948. You can read these stories and more at DeWittCountyToday.com. And in a moment, we'll be talking about uh, what we can expect for the rest of the week because I can see the weekend from here. We can talk about that and see what's happening in the Atlantic. All that coming up in a moment.
Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, with uh, lower humidity, we usually get nice temperatures in the evening, but with higher humidity, which we're going to be getting in the next couple of days, the nighttime temperatures won't be as cool. Right now, it's uh, fairly comfortable out there, but we're going to see stronger and stronger sea breeze over the next couple of days, and that is going to increase the humidity and make it a little bit muggier at nighttime. Last night at this hour, we had some big thunderstorms rolling through Dallas. All that's pretty much gone. It's out in Louisiana and other than that, uh, Texas had a pretty good day, except the temperatures were, you know, just can't get that uh, calendar to agree with the temperatures. We only have uh, that little corner of Texas is possible to have any kind of severe weather. Uh, we did have temperatures uh, today well into the 90s and even hundreds. Yes, uh, we're still getting them. 96 was our high temperature, 98 in San Antonio, but you can see San Angelo at 100 degrees and you're thinking, OK, it's almost fall. Let's do something here. Well, not in the short term, now, maybe in the, you know, seven days, but in uh, the next two, three days, not really happening. We're staying about 96 tomorrow and uh, areas along the Rio Grande will be in the low 100s. And of course, we watch and wait for now. I start looking to the north. All right, this is what I look for. Big area of low pressure dropping down. This is going to be a big winter storm for the northern Rockies. You can see it really winding up and moving south. In fact, that frontal system will actually get into Texas sometime on Monday and affect our weather a little bit. Meanwhile, we have this area of low pressure, which did last night's number, uh, beginning to trigger a few more showers tomorrow. OK, and then this is a really strange one. Uh, this is going to be what looks like a tropical storm, but it's not a tropical storm. It's a low uh, with a frontal system, and it's going to go up the eastern seaboard and drop tremendous amount of rainfall. We're talking five to 10 inches of rain. So it may not be a tropical storm. They're still going to get a mess as that system goes northbound and it'll affect all of the eastern seaboard in the next couple of days. So for us, we watch and wait to see what's happening in the. Um, OK, let's see here. Uh, uh, Jacob, would you kindly go over to my button and push the keyboard? There you go. Thank you very much. There you see the storm go northbound and affect that area as well. All right. Next one will take us to the Atlantic. There's Nigel. Nigel's not going to be a problem for anybody. It's moving up into the northern Atlantic. And then we'll take a close up look. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very interesting system. Uh, this one that uh, will be in Florida because it will be going right up and producing maybe not significant winds, but uh, storm winds and then, of course, the tremendous rainfall. And now here we have what's going to be Ophelia. Ophelia is going to be very interesting. The computer models are already taking it across the Atlantic through the um, Lesser Antilles and then up toward uh, the Bahamas. And that's in seven days, so we're going to watch it very carefully. Meanwhile, if you do have a chance to go do a little fishing tomorrow morning, your sunrise 716, your sunset at 724. It's getting earlier and earlier, so let's go do the day planner 93 tomorrow in Port Lavaca. The next one will take us to Cuero, and that'll get us a high of about 97. And then your seven day forecast. Well, the shower chance is only 20% on Friday. I think we're going to be fine with football games. Nothing like last weekend that continues in the weekend. And here's that little frontal system. It's not much of anything. It's the tail end of it. It's falling apart, but it will give us a, a shot at some shower activity on Tuesday of next week and knock the temperature down maybe five degrees. That is your seven day forecast reminding everybody we do have a QR code. Love for you to scan that and put Crossroads today on your smartphone. And now here's Gino with sports. Thanks, Mac. A few athletes from the Crossroads could benefit from the new NIL partnership in Aggieland. That's coming up after the break.
At a crossroads, a fan who attended Sunday night's game between the New England Patriots and the Miami Dolphins is dead after a fight and the autopsy results are out. According to a CBS station in Boston, the autopsy showed that the victim, Dale Mooney, suffered a medical issue that may have contributed to his death. Eyewitness statements said the fight was between the season ticket holder and a Miami Dolphin fan. The 53-year-old was rushed to the hospital and pronounced dead just before midnight. Currently, there are no charges being filed related to the incident. The Houston Astros hosted the Baltimore Orioles today. Baltimore started off hot and Anthony Sandaria drives one past the shortstop and the runner is rounding third and he slides in safe for the first run of the night going up one to zero early on. Things would quiet down until the eighth inning when Strohs had runners on first and second and Jeremy Pena rockets one to deep right off the wall. Only one run would score. Mauricio Dubon would cross the plate and speak of the devil Dubon in the ninth inning, walks it off and the crowd goes wild. The Astros come back and win. The Strohs currently have an 85 wins on the season and are a half a game ahead of the Seattle Mariners and the Texas Rangers. There are only nine more games left in the Astros season. Who will win the AL West? Only time will tell. Last night, area teams faced off on the hardwood, hardwood and here are the scores. The Victoria East Titans lose its district opener against the Gregory Portland Wildcats. The Lady Titans could not win a single set in that match. The Lady Titans are off on Friday, but will play West on Tuesday at home. Meanwhile, the Victoria West Lady Warriors get its first win in district of the season against CC Ray. West improves to 19 and 12 on the year and was led by Hannah Laced with 15 kills, 13 digs and two blocks. West will play Gregory Portland Friday at home at 5 o'clock. Yoakum volleyball defense was dominant for the second straight matchup. They will they beat Rice and Macy Blakeney on the night had 33 assists to go along with six aces. Gianna Phillips had 12 kills and two aces. And a few Crossroads, Ag what I'm calling them Crossroads Aggies, could potentially benefit from the newest name, image, and likeness deal more ever at Texas A&M than ever. And that's because the Aggies announced T Texas A&M United to, will be an exclusive and official partner for Texas A&M Athletics. Texas Aggies United operates independently from TAMU, but will be directly benefit the student athletes for NIL opportunities. Texas Aggies United will be able to promote TAMU athletic events on radio and social media channels. The three Aggies in Aggieland include football running back Ruben Owens, defensive back Dalton Brooks, and baseball player Ryan Targosh. Well, that's your sports. Don and Karina, back to you. Gina, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Uh, A&M has just announced they're going to have game day. This is game day tours of Kyle Field when the uh, Aggies play there, the home games. I bet that'd be neat for a bunch of people, let's say, in uh, El Campo, want to see Ruben Owens or uh, from no, Shiner. With and Brooks. I mean, yeah. even just Kyle Field is a, it's the biggest stadium in Texas college-wise, and so it's an amazing atmosphere to begin with. And so, yeah, I mean, if you get to see players too, I mean, why not? <laughs> Alrighty. All right. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, Don. Now, stay with us. Coming up on 25 News Now with 10, we'll take a last look at your weather with Mac. Plus, boat crews rescued a ray off the coast of Myrtle Beach.
Tribune has this story. New laws have changed around parking for disabled Texans. You can read the updates on CrossroadsToday.com. The U.S. Army Golden Knights parachute team showed off their skills at an Air Force base in Alabama Tuesday. The Golden Knights, the Army's premier aerial demonstration team, sailed through the sky and executed picture-perfect landings. They're conducting a tandem camp where they give community partners the Army experience, and that included a tandem jump for any willing participant. <laughs> oh my, the tandem camp continues through Wednesday. The 2024 Olympic crowds will admire a new spire towering over the iconic Notre Dame. The scaffolding around the spire will come down before the Olympic Games kick off in Paris next summer. At a ribbon cutting event outside the cathedral, workers were installing fire protection systems in the 12th century edifice. A worksite village at the cathedral opened up several days ago where locals and tourists saw carpenters, stonemasons, and stained glass artists showcased showcasing their craftsmanship and of course they're also trying to redo Notre Dame after that terrible fire oh, wow. uh, a few back. years yeah. ago uh, uh, and they're doing very well with that and can you believe the Olympics are less than a year away the Summer Olympics Wow uh, I, I'm still uh, stunned at how they were able to carve those gargoyles that's amazing uh, oh, in yeah. the 12th century the tw you yeah. know and, and now you know here we are with chisels and hammers going Chink, 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 chink. How they it's did it, it's just amazing. Yeah. But, I didn't know that but, made that sound. <laughs> <laughs> but when it, when it burned, I mean, it just hurt. Oh, it, was, it was terrible. It just, oh. I mean, it just hurt to see that. I mean, it's so much history in that chapel. Oh, absolutely. Amazing. Uh, well, anyway, folks, we were headed toward the weekend. Uh, we're looking at uh, pretty good looking weather for Tuesday. I think we'll have a few light showers uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but uh, these are going to be very light. They don't have any what we call support or forcing. And so um, I don't think you're going to have a problem on Friday night. And then we'll watch and wait to see if that little frontal system actually makes it through here and gives us a northeast wind and cools us down to 91. Ah, I'm looking Burr. forward to it. <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Mac. Now a manta ray was rescued by a boat crew off the coast in Myrtle Beach. The ray appeared to get tangled in the buoys on the tail end of the boat, but luckily for the ray, several people jumped in the water to help free it. After a couple of minutes of fidgeting with the rope, the crew was able to untangle and free that ray. Good job, people. Mm -hmm. are, are raises the dangerous ones with the spiky tail? Uh, it, it depends on the breed and the species because uh, the one with the hook, that, that can get you. Mm, seems but we got to research after brave. this. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Mac. Thank you, Dong. And thank you for joining us for 25 News Now at 10. Join us for 25 News Now Sunrise starting at 5 a.m. Have a good night, everybody.